Queen's 60th, and then the Olympics. Like, what else do you guys have? Is there, <laughs> you got something else up your sleeve you're going to pull out here in another week or two? But revival, come on. It's, it really, I just, sitting there, I really felt like just declaring, it's time for the kingdom to advance in, in the UK. It really is. It's just, it's just the perfect time. And uh, the Lord uh, works so wonderfully with natural events. Uh, I never paid much attention to dates and events and stuff like that, it, you know, and, until I found out that he liked them. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm trying to get it nailed down that uh, he's right and I'm making the adjustments. And uh, So uh, honestly, I've been learning so much on just how much he pays attention to the, the simplest things, the simplest details that just are so important to him. And it makes, uh, my wife, uh, we, we were stuck in traffic forever. I don't know if you guys invented traffic or what, but, but we, 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 didn't, we didn't go very far in a very long time. And so I, I was late as a result, but to my wife just checking in at the, at the hotel, getting our room settled. But um, being married to her is so much fun because everything is just an adventure, everything. She just, she hears from the Lord so frequently, so constantly about unique things. And it's just a, it's just a, a real treat, a real fun thing, just to watch her and her adventure with God. And, and it's, uh, it's just, uh, it, you know, it's just, it's time to grow up and become a child again, you know, <laughs> where, where everything's, everything's an adventure. Uh, you know, uh, children never dream of being insignificant. They, they only dream of wearing the cape and flying through the air, <laughs> fixing all the world's problems or something like that, you know, it's in that neighborhood. And, and one of the large parts of the Christian life that, uh, that needs to be reactivated and perhaps restored to many of us is this whole, this whole task is probably the wrong word, but this whole role of entering into that childlike adventure once again. And I feel like uh, part of what's going to happen here in these couple of days is is just that. So we'll, uh, we'll have fun. How many of you just, we, you just promised to have fun? All right, all right. Well, I, I have a, a non-spiritual story to read real quick just because I have the mic. A guy is 84 years old and he loves to fish. He was sitting in his boat the other day when he heard a voice say, pick me up. He looked around, he couldn't see anyone. He thought he was dreaming until he heard the voice say again, pick me up. He looked in the water, and there floating on the top was a frog. The man said, are you talking to me? The frog said, yes, I'm talking to you. Pick me up, then kiss me, and I'll turn into the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. I will be your bride. The man looked at the frog for a short time, reached over, picked it up carefully, placed it in his shirt pocket. The frog said, what, are you nuts? Didn't you hear what I said? I said, kiss me and I will be your beautiful bride. He opened his pocket, looked at the frog and said, nah, at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> I think that's funny. I think that's, it's, it's risky to read humor from one country to the other, but I thought, this one maybe would translate well, so, all right. Um, I've got two things that I want to talk to you about. I get one session with you here, and I want to merge uh, a theme that's not hard to merge. I want to talk to you about why Jesus came. It's, I made a list once. I, I went through the New Testament and tried to find every phase I could find that described the purpose of his coming. We know that he came to destroy the works of the evil one. We know that he came to die. He didn't just die for us, he actually died as us. He died in our place. He took upon himself what I deserved so I could take upon myself what he deserved. We know that he came to initiate the existence or the realization or the opportunity to step in and experience the reality of the kingdom of God is a very large part of why he came. We can go through a long list and all of the things that probably any of us would state on that list would be accurate and true. But they all point to one thing. They all point to his number one task in coming to earth. 
He came to reveal the Father. Everything he did was pointing to that one task. Why did he cast out devils? Because that's what a father does. For his child removes the torment and the evil, the things that compromise their purpose for life. Why did he heal the sick? Same thing, all of those things was so that he could reveal the Father. Jesus revealed the Father because nothing prior to his coming adequately revealed God as Father. Everything previous to Jesus addressed the sinful condition of man. Everything previous, everything before Jesus revealed the severity of sin, the hopeless condition, the there is no cure for your problem uh, deal except that a Messiah would come, a spotless lamb would come and die in your place. Everything was set to reveal the severity, the punishment, the penalty, the lost condition, the hopeless condition of humanity. Everything. But none of that revealed the Father. I realize there's prophetic words, I realize there's glimpses, but nothing adequately revealed the Father, that's why Jesus came. It's such a big deal that Jesus, in, in his prayer, which I'll call the Lord's Prayer in John 17, the one that we call the Lord's Prayer is, was, is actually disciples' prayer, because in that prayer he said, forgive us our sin, he didn't have any, so it wasn't his prayer, but it was, it was a model prayer that fit everybody else but him. <clears throat> and, and he taught the disciples that prayer, but his prayer in John 17, he stood before the Father, and he said, he said, I made manifest your name. He said, I declared your word. He said, I performed your works. And he went through this list. All, all things that he was assigned to do, he came to do, because he had one simple but profound task, and that was to reveal the Father. You see, he did it because the entire planet is a planet of orphans. Benny and I, my wife and I uh, had uh, several foster children. Do you have a foster child system? Is it called, is it called that here? Okay. Um, had uh, several foster children in our, our care throughout our, our raising kids. The, uh, the most tragic one was, was um, there was this uh, family of five boys and the mother killed herself because of the abuse she had suffered and the father finally killed himself and told the boys, make sure you do the same so that you can be with us. And, you know, these five little boys, you know, just the torment they went through, and they're all just little guys, you know. And uh, they had to split the family up, and we took two of them for a season. And, and um, it's, it's sobering when you, when, you're, when you live in a healthy environment to see the difference between sons and daughters who know who they are and orphans that come into your home. They were in intensive counseling for obvious reasons. But it was, it was so cool. The Lord just did such a dramatic work in them. I think it was two or three weeks. Within two or three weeks of them being in our home, they, they canceled all the counseling. They removed them from counseling because they, they just got things sorted out uh, sufficiently where they could do life. And, uh, but it was, it was interesting, the first night at the dinner table, uh, when you have orphans at the table, uh, they grab every bit of food they can find on the table, pile it up on their plate, and they guard it. They protect it because they don't know if there's going to be anything tomorrow. And there's a lot of Christians that live that way. They just haven't yet discovered that he really is a father. You see, he's not, he's not the caretaker of an orphanage who guarantees three meals in a cot, three meals a day and a place to sleep. He's different than that. Now, I, I don't know that I was ever taught this, but somehow I, I picked up somewhere along the way in my, in my journey with the Lord as a young person, I, I caught this idea that God is, 
is not intensely interested in your desires, but he's very committed to your needs. Desires versus needs. In the last, um, I don't know how many years, if I guessed I'd be wrong, but I'll just say 10 years or so, I've been on this, this interesting shift in my relationship with the Lord in my idea of what he wants from me. And I, I have found, well, here's the deal. When you come to the Lord, how I many know there's a straight and narrow road? There's only one way to the Father. It's through the only door that exists. His name is Christ Jesus. You don't go in trying. Uh, you, don't, you don't get in by self-effort. You don't go in saying, hey, I'd like to experiment with Jesus a little bit, see how this works. The only way you get in is not my will but yours be done. I mean, the only way you get in is to, is, is to die. I mean, that's the entrance. You, you, you embrace Christ and his suffering and you enter into eternal life. But for most of us, the problem is once we come into the kingdom, we're still walking a straight and narrow road, not realizing that inside the kingdom is actually bigger than outside. And I'm, I'm sitting here doing this tightrope thing, afraid that I'm, I'm gonna do something wrong and the father says, uh, son, what, what would you like? Uh, thy will be done. Uh, that's what I want. And he says, yeah, yeah, I know. That's how, that's how you got in. Uh, now, what, what would you like? What, what would you like? I, I, my whole desire is just to please you. That's, that's my whole desire. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's good. Um, what's, son, what's in your heart? And he keeps coming back to this, and I keep trying to give him religious answers, and I feel like he just says, would you stop it? <laughs> would you stop it? What, what's in your heart? It's like what happens is the church, us as believers, we keep crucifying the resurrected man in the name of discipleship. He gives us a new nature that is to dream, a new nature that is to see, is to live is to illustrate life, is to represent and mirror this amazing father. One of the most stunning moments for me in the Bible, it's been wrecking me in, in recent weeks. Again, it comes in cycles. A woman is caught in adultery and is thrown at Jesus' feet. The religious leaders have stones in their hands to kill her, because that's the law. I can tell what motivates people. I can tell if they're bound by a religious spirit or a political spirit, and I know how to figure it out. Just throw a controversy in the middle of the group. And the ones who wash their hands and separate a distance so nobody will associate me with that problem, that's Pilate, that's the political spirit. And those who want to show their zeal by judging the sin in the sinner, that's the religious spirit. But Jesus stooped, and he began to write in the sand. I've heard great sermons of what he wrote, but nobody knows. <laughs> I tend to believe whoever I heard last. You know? <laughs> but he, he, he wrote in the sand. We don't know what he wrote, but what we know is what he wrote released such an atmosphere of grace that law fled, judgment fled. And he is sitting there alone with a woman. He does not have to tell this woman to put her faith in him. An atmosphere of grace, faith is the most normal response. Faith is trust. In an atmosphere of grace, you find who is trustworthy. Here's the thing that st strikes me about this story. Jesus stoops in the sand and here's the woman caught in adultery. He came to reveal the Father. Why doesn't he stone her? because he can't if he's to reveal the father. This moment right here is a father-daughter moment. See, if, if my daughter was caught in some kind of mess like that, I wouldn't take one moment to worry about what anybody on the planet thought of me in that moment. I am father-daughter because I've got to restore her to a place of confidence in what is God as a father. I have no religious agenda. 
I have no, you know, I, I, I have nothing to accomplish but to manifest the heart of a father that so frees her from shame that she finds it easy to put faith in God. It's a father-daughter moment. So Jesus did so much to reveal this father, and he's so perfectly good. He's better than you can, you can imagine. He's better than we think, so we have to change the way we think. But look at just a few verses with me. Uh, we're going to bounce around a little bit, so get your gospel track shoes on. And go to John 14. We'll start there. How long does this go? I forgot to ask. Duncan, do you know how long this goes? Okay. What time is 1600? You're kidding. Is it four? It's 3.55. I have the anointed clock right here. Okay, we'll figure, we'll figure it out. Oh, I, I, I don't want to go to five, but okay, that's all I need to know. I'm late, that's all I needed to know. John 14, look at this passage. Following the, one of my most favorite verses, verse 12, where he says, greater works than these shall you do, verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatever you ask, now, I, we're going to read some more, so just hang, hang on here in, in a second, for, for a second here. I, I, used to, I used to teach it like this, that if you, if you pray for what God tells you to pray for, then he will answer your prayers. That's not entirely wrong, but it's, it's kind of a stupid way of saying it, because we're not robots. We're not robots that get programmed so that if we do the right thing, he will then be free to answer us. That's just not the way it works. When the Lord says, whatever you ask, he is actually making himself vulnerable to your input. That went over pretty well. <laughs> All right, verse 13, look at it again. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Interesting, isn't it? The Father is glorified in the Son when you get answers to prayer. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The Father is glorified in the Son, why? Because the Son is able to release purpose and promise in revealing the Father that liberates you enough to take risk and to cry out and get answers and God is glorified by your answers. How many of you gave praise to God when Duncan shared that testimony of the, of the young lady that was healed? How many of you honestly did? It, it, you didn't even have to try. All right. Without that miracle, that glory never would have gotten to God. When we withhold that kind of life from humanity, we actually withhold glory from God. When we fail to dream, we restrict the glory that God is supposed to receive. You were born to dream, that's what children do. Unfortunately, in this culture, one of the signs of growing up is the dreams start dwindling, start shifting from the weird, I want to fly across the room to survival. And, and the Lord's he's not interested in it. He's looking for people that will partner with him. He actually has a heart for co-laboring. John 15. John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. In this context, the fruit is answers to your prayers. How do you think the Father, how, how do you think the glory of God is supposed to fill the earth? Is it through a military invasion? Or is it by a people that are in such harmony with God 
that their heart is his heart. His heart is their heart. And he becomes manifest in presence and purpose all over the earth. We have to stop waiting for the big bang. Did you know that everything that God created has glory? Did you know you have glory? You can't give him glory if you don't have glory. Everything that God made was given a measure of glory, right down to the animals. When Adam named the animals, he had to discern the measure of glory and assignment they were given on the earth, give them a name accordingly. Everything, the planets, according to the Psalms, have glory. Everything that God made has glory. You have glory resonant in you and upon you. It's an unending source of glory because you are made in the image of the eternal Father. You were born to co-labor with God so that his purposes in that world would be accomplished in this world. And they're not going to happen through a military invasion. They are to happen through sons and daughters that learn as they get restored to a place of dreaming, of partnering, of co-laboring with the Lord to see his purposes accomplished on the earth. Listen, what Jesus said as the Father said,